Welcome to the In Context War Report, produced by MDR Productions, Inc. The In Context War Report is broadcast at noon on the fourth Monday of the month on WPKN 89.5 FM in Bridgeport, Connecticut, streaming live at WPKN.org. Our website is InContextReport.com. I'm Gus Cantavero, the producer of The War Report, and here's your host, Ken McDermott Rowe. Hello, everyone. This is Ken McDermott Rowe, and Gus and I are joined by The War Report's military affairs commentator, Marshad McDermott Rowe. Hello, Marshad. Hello. Thanks for having me. In The War Report, we report on recent developments in war and geopolitics around the world. By placing these developments in, in historical context, we show how they affect global stability and U.S. national security. In today's show, we're going to focus on the latest developments in the war in the Ukraine, as well as the conflict with the Islamic State. But first, let's take a look at some other interesting developments. In our last war report, we discussed the shortcomings of the U.S.'s new expensive fighter jet, the F-35. After years of development, it's still not functional. Nonetheless, we recently learned that the Pentagon plans to spend about $10.6 billion on the F-35 in the fiscal year ending October 1st, a 23% increase over the previous year. Uh, Comments, March, Gus? Well, I think that, again, this is just, it's lunatic. It really is. Investing in a combat system that clearly won't be capable and will, in fact, probably be outdated by the time it is unveiled. The other thing that strikes me is um, I was doing some research on the German invasion of Russia, and one of the things that the author I was reading commented on was how the Germans developed a plethora, a dizzying plethora of different types of tanks and airplanes, and the problem is they didn't have enough of any one type. They had some of the best tanks and some of the best planes in the world. The problem is they produced so many different types, they end up with a handful of really good planes and a lot of more or less mediocre planes and tanks. And I feel like that in a lot of ways what we're heading to with the F-35. We're producing this incredibly expensive aircraft that is full of faults. And by the time we're able to develop it, number one, it'll be too expensive to to mass produce. And number two, it's going to be out of date by the time it's produced because already the Russians have developed their new ground attack fighter and their new air-to-air fighter that already, at least so we've so research has shown, been able to compete with our F-35 and then so too of the Chinese. Everybody has already played catch up to an aircraft we haven't even made combat capable yet. Alrighty, and in another area, uh, Marchand, uh, we did a show a few months ago devoted exclusively to the conflict in Palestine. A recent report in Haaretz noted that since the beginning of 2015, Israel has already demolished 77 homes uh, in the West Bank. Uh, as a result, 110 people, around half of them children, have lost their homes at the height of the winter. Haaretz also reported that last year, 2014, Israel demolished the homes of 1,177 Palestinians in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Uh, March and Gus, can you comment on that? Well, it's only the middle of February, and they've already demolished 77 houses, so that's a pretty good clip that they're, they're bulldozing. At. I mean, we saw just right after the new year that they announced a whole new slew of settlements that uh, they're deciding to build completely in the face of all opposition around the world. People have voiced their opinion very strongly that they don't own this land. They haven't bought the land legally. Nobody has consented to them building these these settlements. They know that it's downright aggressive and yes. offensive to the people that they're building the settlements near. I don't understand if their number one concern is peace. Why would they continue to do the one thing that uh, their nearest neighbor finds the most offensive? Yes. And as we reported in the last show uh, during the Cap David Accords, President Jimmy Carter had an understanding, a verbal understanding with the leader of stop. Israel that they would stop and uh, the settlements. And at that point, there were just a handful of settlers mm, in the West yeah. Bank. And now I understand there's something like 300,000. Yeah, that's so a lot it's, now. It's a and we saw the call by block. Netanyahu for more Europeans to move to Israel. Yes. Right? They have to fill those buildings with people. So this is a central problem in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Right. And Israel's not really <laughs> going to move closer to peace with this. They don't seem like they're making much of an effort to negotiate here. Another subject that uh, came up recently is the UK's Royal Air Force had to scramble fighting jets after a pair of nuclear-capable Russian bombers flew across a busy civilian air traffic corridor above the English Channel. The bombers, these Russian bombers, had their transponders turned off, mm. making them invisible to many af- uh, air traffic control systems. Uh, Marshawn, what do you make of this arguably threatening uh, overflight of the English Channel by Russian English bombers? Were they in English airspace? I don't, I, don't, well, I don't believe so. I think just the English Channel. 
Yeah, from what I read, they had not entered English airspace. The thing okay. that frustrated the English the most seemed to be the fact that they turned their transponders off because right. the whole purpose of the transponders is to notify civilian air yeah. traffic controllers mm -hmm. and civilian aircraft who are flying through the area don't slam into us. Right. But they turned them off. And I think part of that was a demonstration of force to the British because the British have been very supportive of the Ukrainian government. Mm -hmm. They have been very supportive in terms of sending armored vehicles, as has been reported in a number of outlets, to the Ukraine. So I think part of this was an intimidation factor showing the British government that, you know, we can, we can get bombers right on your coast because it's a slight turn and you're over a major English city. The other thing, because the channel was fairly narrow, the other thing that's very important when examining this is Prime Minister David Cameron of the United Kingdom said, well, basically, we're not we're not going to be intimidated by this. We're not going to give it the dignity of, you know, upping our alert status of uh, responding to these flyovers of the English Channel. It is an intimidating show of force. There have been recent reports uh, in the Associated Press and National Response Press that Britain is now opposing arming the Ukrainians. Uh, David Cameron's sort of, you know, oh, we're not going to let this get to us, really mm -hmm. belies the fact that he is worried, that it does worry the English people, because fundamentally, the Russians have a much la larger military, much larger air force, yeah. and the fact that their bombers can get so close before they're intercepted definitely sends a, a chill down the spine of a nation. And the number of sorties by Russian bombers and near flybys off the Canadian coast, off the U.S. coast, the Scandinavian coastline, Denmark, and the United Kingdom have really increased exponentially. In fact, we're looking at a much higher tempo that probably one that we haven't seen since the Cold War. Yeah, you know, Heathrow is one of the most busy airports in the entire planet. And for them to fly by by England in that direct line of traffic between them and Europe with their transponders off is Kind of a frightening And as situation. we previously reported, the Russians have uh, subs uh, stationed in the Caribbean because That's of their, right. uh, their ally in Venezuela now. And we understand that they are cruising up and down the east yeah. coast of the United States. Seems that their strategy is to just let you know they're there. Yes, yes. <laughs> One of the things that is really, it's not talked about in the U.S. press, but it leaks out occasionally through intelligence sources, leaks out a bit in the foreign press. The fact that the Russians have an intelligence post in Cuba, which they acknowledge having, staffed with some 2,000-some-odd personnel. It's an intelligence hub. Their ships dock there to refuel Venezuela. Russian submarines dock there to refuel. And they make sorties up and down our coast. And, I mean, this is not acknowledged in the U.S. press, but it's a very scary reality because it means if we really decide to up the ante, they're pretty close to us. And men, much of our fleet is overseas. They really come within range of seriously hurting us. In relation to the rising tensions between the West and Russia, it's interesting to note that NATO recently announced it will establish six new command centers in Eastern European country in the coming months in response, specifically in response to Russia, it was said to be Russia aggressiveness. Uh, the outpost will form a chain of command centers for NATO's new uh, rapid response force, said to, to be planned for 5,000 troops. The six rapid deployment units are going to be stationed in Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania. And the idea is that they will be capable of rapidly reinforcing the region in response to any threat from Russia, and plans for an additional 25,000 troops are to be available uh, to support these 5,000 within a week of their being put in place. Now, last September, it's also interesting to note, uh, the Ukraine, Poland, and Lithuania agreed to form a joint military force to take part in the first joint military drill in 2015. And this is slated to become some kind of a UN or EU peacekeeping force. And presumably, it will form, also form a NATO battle group in the region bordering Russia. Now, what is your assessment of the effectiveness of this response to Russia are these NATO military plans adequate to match the potential of the Russian military? If we're talking about matching force for force, 5,000, 25,000 is laughable. The Russians can mobilize 900,000 in 24 hours. What NATO is planning for, at least from what it appears, is for asymmetric war with the Russians. Now, you know that these command posts are all in former Soviet satellite countries, Warsaw Pact countries, and they're also in countries where we are afraid the Russians are going to try to do the same thing that they did in the Ukraine. Now, 5,000 troops, 25,000 troops, 
could hold back a militia force like we see in Ukraine yeah. and maybe some the uh, Russian quote unquote volunteers or regulars slipped in under the table. But if we're talking about an all out confrontation, which it seems to be where we're careening towards. Right. The official military. Kind of, exactly. This kind of force would be woefully inadequate hmm. because when we were prepared to fight the Soviet military, the combined NATO forces was several million strong. The Ukraine is just the first domino in an ever escalating cascade. If you notice when dominoes fall, the first one falls slowly, but then the process speeds up. That's what we're, lo- we're really looking at. It's not that the Russians might necessarily start inching their way into Latvia, Lithuania, but very realistically, if we start pushing back in the Ukraine, they're going to push back harder and it could lead to an all-out confrontation. Hungary, this new leader, is getting closer to Russia. Can the NATO count on the loyalty of some of these other Eastern European countries like, say, Bulgaria? Are they solidly in the Western camp or could they go like Hungary and start to move closer to Russia? I think it's very possible that they could because Russia in its present state, is not the Soviet Union. It's not, because their ideology is no longer that of left-wing communism. You know, you own a bagel shop, it's now going to be owned by the state. It's much more of a right-wing, almost a fascist ideology. And to a lot of these Eastern European countries are looking around, they've said, well, we supported the breakup of the Soviet Union because we thought it would bring prosperity. And look at Romania, for example, has one of the highest unemployment rates in the EU. Poverty is unbelievable in Romania and in most of these Eastern European countries. So I think for a lot of the very pragmatic leaders like Orban would say, well, wait a minute, we could fight the Russians and potentially lose. Or alternatively, we could become closer to them and part of this new economic block, which is made up of the new Russian economic block is made up of all of the emerging economies, China, India, Brazil. For the the, the Bulgarians, the Hungarians, they, they might be starting to look at this and say, well, you know what? NATO, the EU didn't bring us prosperity. So maybe we'll, we'll start turning towards the Russians because, again, it's not that aggressive communism that many of them feared. And it's worth noting that Orban, who's the head of Hungary, actually participated in the overthrow of the communist government. But it was because he was anti-communist, not necessarily anti-Russian. And I think that's why you're starting to see a pull more towards the Russian sphere. In terms of countries like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, you're seeing a much more militant right-wing response. Uh, in fact, in I believe it was Latvia, they erected a monument to the Latvian SS. So what you're seeing is not so much a battle of ideologies, but rather of ethnic nationalists when it comes to those Baltic states and a growing rise in neo-Nazis. Indeed, that's why the, the staunchest supporters of the West in Ukraine right now, it's sad to say, are neo-Nazis. I mean, they, they, they use the SS Wolf's angle as the symbol of one of their battalions, the Azov Battalion. The Wolf's angle was a symbol of the SS Das Reich Division. I mean, this says a lot about the elements that support us in Eastern Europe. If you just tuned in, you're listening to the In Context War Report on WPKN, 89.5 FM in Bridgeport, Connecticut, streaming at WPKN.org. I'm Ken McDermott Rowe, your host, and I'm joined by Marshawn McDermott Rowe, our military affairs commentator, and Gus Cantavero, our producer. Now the, now, the Eastern Europeans, formerly vassals of the Soviet Union, now have been roped into NATO, virtually all of them except for the Ukraine. So Russia is looking out for allies, and recently the Russian chief of staff announced that Russia is in preliminary negotiation with the armed forces of Brazil, Vietnam, and Cuba, and North Korea. Uh, with the idea of having some kind of unspecified military cooperation with them. Specifically, though, joint exercises are being planned with Cuba and North Korea. What do you think of the ability of the Russians to expand their alliances to try to counter the expansion of NATO? Well, what they're doing is they're reaching out to countries that have naturally been antagonistic towards the U.S. North Korea, of course, has always been antagonistic of the U.S., but what has often held North Korea back is China. Now Russia's reaching out to North Korea. They're reaching out to Cuba, and the Cubans have no love for the Americans because Obama said, I want to open up an embassy, and the Cubans said, that's fine. You close down Guantanamo and give the naval base back to us. We'll open up an embassy, which means if the Cubans aren't much of a navy, it would ipso facto become a Russian naval base. So naturally, yes. uh, the administration said no and pretended like that the subject of easing the sanctions and opening an embassy was never broached to the Cubans. It was a report that was released in the Army Times, and I'm going back uh, about a year or so, that said the U.S. military is no longer capable of fighting more than one 
large conflict at a time. So from the Russian perspective, if they have strong military assets in North Korea, in Cuba, I mean, imagine if war were to break out in Ukraine and Russia were to give the nod to North Korea, you can invade South Korea. We could take on the North Koreans, just not while fighting the Russians. And imagine if they were to do the same to the Iranians or they were to allow the Cubans to harass us in the Caribbean, you know, harass shipping and whatnot along our coast. This is a potent military threat. The Russians are playing our game. They decide you want to hem us in, we'll hem you in. How about Egypt, March? That's another place the Russians are making a move. General el-Sisi, who is now president of Egypt, is fighting an insurgency in the Sinai, which now the Sinai is ipso facto controlled by ISIS. It is, they call themselves the Sinai province, and they're also fighting ISIS in Libya on their other front. They've asked the Americans for attack helicopters. They've asked the Americans for military aid, and President Obama says, no, we're going we're gonna to instead help the Saudis out who also fund ISIS. It's a little backwards logic, but okay. On the same vein, though, Egypt now is looking towards other allies, and Russia has seen an opportunity. President Putin, not that long ago, earlier in the month of February, traveled to Egypt to meet with President LCC and to offer him things like uh, building nuclear power plants to bring power to Egypt, to bring electricity, which from a geopolitical standpoint is brilliant because now all of the Egyptians are going to say, well, I have electricity now thanks to the Russians, so well, let's support the Russians. And then, of course, he can promise things like military advisors, arms. One of the things he has asked for in the past is a naval base in Alexandria, a second naval base on the Mediterranean. We've really blown an opportunity with by cozying up more with the Saudis and the Gulf states. We've really blown an opportunity with Egypt, which is, strategically speaking, one of the most important players in the region. Now, NATO's confrontation with Russia brings us to the conflict in the Ukraine. And as reported, the elected pro-Russian Ukrainian government was overthrown about a year ago in a U.S.-backed coup. Soon thereafter, the ethnic Russian community in eastern Ukraine revolted and has attempted to set up a separate republic. The separatists are backed by Russia, while the government in Kiev receives aid from the United States. Some hope for an end to the fighting emerged recently, when the Germans, French, and Russians brokered a ceasefire at a conference in Minsk. Marshad, what is the present state of the conflict in the Ukraine? It's clear the peace treaty has completely fallen apart, for lack of a better term. The recent fall of Debaltseva demonstrated the weakness of the Ukrainian army. The Ukrainian army, which had about 5,000 to 8,000, we're not entirely sure, troops in Debaltseva collapsed. They completely collapsed. And President Poroshenko said, oh, well, it was an organized withdrawal. We planned it. But in an interview, a journalist from Agence France Press traveled with the, and met with the retreating Ukrainian troops. And they said it was anything but a strategic withdrawal. Most of them said they didn't know that they were retreating until they saw all their tanks leave. Many said they'd been abandoned by their officers. And around close to 2,000 Ukrainian troops left, which also leads one to wonder what happened to the rest of them. It was a major military catastrophe for the Ukrainian army. So the situation on the ground is very, very tenuous. But that's precisely why on February 19th, President Poroshenko reached out to first his security cabinet, which was headed by former president, well, led by the former president Alexander Turchinov and uh, current prime minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk and uh, said, we want to request to have either a UN peacekeeping force or fail that an EU peacekeeping force in the east, not only to secure the rebel, the border with the rebel held area, but also to secure the border with Russia, which is obviously something the Russians aren't going to agree to. They're basically inviting in NATO. Are the Kiev government troops in control of a significant part of eastern Ukraine? They do control a significant portion of the Lugansk province and uh, a portion of the Donetsk province, but they're out of rebel-held territory at this time. The front line seems to have stabilized, although now there is concern that the rebels are beginning their advance in the city of Mariupol, which is on the Sea of Azov. It's in that little inlet between Ukraine and Crimea. There, There is fear that the rebels will begin advancing outward there, but for the time being, the front line is secure. And Debaltseva was very significant because it was a thorn that jutted into the side of the rebel republics. By securing that, they've secured a strategic front line. And so that's that seems to, for the time being, have stabilized. But the Ukrainian army right now is in no position to launch a counterattack because right now the only ones who seem to be fighting are the militant neo-Nazi battalions of the Azov battalion in the right sector. The head of the right sector, uh, Dmitry Yarosh, said that his movement rejected the Minsk peace deal and that their paramilitary units in eastern Ukraine would continue active fighting according to their own plans. 
I followed in uh, real time as much as I could from the moment that the ceasefire went into effect at midnight Ukraine time. And almost immediately there was shelling in Donetsk and Lugansk. Of course, the Ukrainian army claims the rebels shelled their own territory. And, you know, who's to say? I mean, everybody's probably a little Machiavellian at this stage. But the fact is, is that there were large elements of the Ukrainian force, the right sector battalions, who said they weren't going to observe the ceasefire. So, I mean, the thing was doomed from the start. When we look at the situation on the ground right now, it's hardly surprising that the fighting has continued. But what is the most surprising is the very rapid disintegration of the Ukrainian army. One wonders about the morale of the Ukrainian army. If I were from Kiev, I wonder if I would want to be drafted and sent to fight in eastern Ukraine. There are a lot, a lot of young Ukrainians that are trying to dodge the draft. Why are, why are we fighting? You know, right. why, why are, you know, but clearly the West doesn't have an interest in backing us up. We're fighting a futile war against a power that's much stronger than ours. And, yeah. you know, really, do I care what goes on in Donetsk? Well, let's, and, let's sum up the situation. All right, you've got you've got the East, which is determined to fight back because they feel like they're abused by the West. The West has a government that's completely illegitimate. That's the product of a United States-backed military coup that the people really don't believe in or ever voted for or want. The people don't want to fight in the war because they feel like they've got nothing to gain by it. This is a situation that just needs to stop. And also the, the people in the Ukraine are suffering a very significant decline right. in, their, in their living standards. It's reported the IMF just approved loans to the Ukraine, which will be used not to, to build highways no, and, God and bridges. It's going to be used <laughs> to finance the war in the east right, right. and to service existing debt of the Ukraine. In return for giving the loan, the, the Ukraine government had to make structural readjustment concessions, which include laying off 10 percent of the country's public employees. Right. The partial privatization of its health care and educational system, raising the retirement age and, and abolishing some benefits for old age. Right, so this is ludicrous. I mean, and, nobody and, stands to and gain de anybody. Deregulating the pharmaceutical market. So we can sell Western drugs. And, and, and meanwhile, the, 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 the country's experienced very rapid in, inflation while salaries aren't going to go well, aren't shocker, going anywhere. Right. So I would think that the average person in Ukraine would be thinking that I'm not getting much out of the situation. No, this is stupid. I want to go home. Then who wants to be involved in this? The, the only people in Ukraine right now who seem to be willing to fight to the death for over this are your militant neo-Nazis. Now, the United States is undertaking some response. General Ben Hodges, the U.S. Army Europe commander, announced that a U.S. battalion will start training Ukraine troops in Ukraine, uh, fighting separatists in southeast Ukraine. Hodges said, quote, we'll train them in security tasks, medical tasks, how to operate in an environment where the Russians are jamming communications, and how to protect themselves from Russian <laughs> and rebel artillery. This deployment <laughs> of U.S. troops to the Ukraine is opposed by both Russia and the EU, uh, who agree that there can be no military solution to the Ukrainian crisis. Are these troops going to make a significant difference in the military situation? Is it just a way to get U.S. troops on the ground in the country uh, as an excuse for perhaps a larger deployment? Uh, what do you think, Marshawn? I think part of this is trying to intimidate the Russians, trying to up the ante, as it were. And certainly now, especially with the Ukraine asking for EU troops, they know that the that UN peacekeepers will never be approved because Russia will veto it, or Russia will make conditions that neither the US or the Ukraine will ever agree to. The only alternative becomes EU slash NATO troops. And it would be very easy to begin moving these troops a little closer to the front lines like we've done in Iraq. Now, the Germans and the French seem to be ambivalent about U.S. policy in the Ukraine. On the one hand, they're part of NATO. On the other hand, they don't want war with Russia, and they were the ones who brokered this Minsk peace conference where the ceasefire was arranged with the Russians. What do you think the Germans and the French are going to do as we move forward? It's tough to say because right now there are some sources in Germany that are saying the German government's attitude is that they no longer oppose the supplying of arms because they feel the peace accord has failed and they don't know what else to do. But it's a long jump to say they no longer oppose sending arms to that Germany will send its own troops. Certainly we'll have no trouble dragging the Poles, the Latvians, the Lithuanians, and the Estonians in with us. But as for the Germans and the French, I mean, one has to remember that for us, World War II is a distant memory. But for Germans, there are people alive in Germany today who remember the siege of Berlin. They remember the last time the Red Army was in Germany. And they don't want to see that again. And moreover, the largest growing party in Germany is Die Linke, the left, and they're pro-Russian. And then meanwhile, the fastest growing party in France is the National Front, their right wing. And they 
are opposed to war with Russia. If we're going to look at this situation, it will probably be predominantly an American slash Eastern European intervention. I think I would have a hard time imagining European troops getting involved in this in a significant fashion. I think it would be kind of like one of those token, you know, there's like the German communication officer <laughs> mixed in with the American yeah. unit just to make to the, the showing of the Germany, the, the five French guys who show up. But I think this is going to be a mostly predominantly American-backed operation. It seems like both the Russians and the Americans are trying to achieve their uh, political objectives. For, for the Americans, it is to, to rope all of you, a united Ukraine into NATO and yeah. for the Russians, I, I'm not clear. Is there, there is their objective to support the separatists and have a, an Eastern Ukraine that's not part of this NATO uh, Ukraine? Or do they, would they really like to see a pro-Russian government back in Kiev? Best of all possible worlds for the Russians would be a, a pro-Russian government in Kiev. But I think even then, what the Russians desire is a buffer zone. When we look at Russian history, when we look at World War II in particular, why did Stalin grab as much land as he possibly could in the Pacific, in Europe, it was because what he wanted was a buffer zone to ensure that Germany and that the West would never invade Russia again. And let's go back even further. During the Great Game, when the European powers and even the Americans, when everybody was grabbing for colonies, you know, we grabbed the Philippines, we grabbed parts of China, Japanese grabbed parts of China, the British and the French and the Germans were grabbing bits of Africa and India and whatnot. The Russians focused entirely on countries on their border. They tried to invade Afghanistan back in the 19th century, but the reason was, was because they were afraid the British were going to invade and control Afghanistan and use it as a route to invade Russia. And similarly, the Crimean War was fought over controlling Russia's buffer zone. They spent most of their time during the Great Game fighting the Turks because the Turks were on the Russian border. They weren't interested right. in colonies in Africa. It has so a lot to do with geography. Uh, uh, Marshawn and Gus, I just want to remind listeners, if they just tuned in, that they're listening to the In Context War Report on WPKN 89.5 FM in Bridgeport, Connecticut, streaming at WPKN.org. I'm Ken McDermott Rowe, your host, and I'm joined by Marshawn McDermott Rowe, our military affairs commentator, and Gus Cadavero, our producer. The show is broadcast on the fourth Monday of the month at noon, and to download a copy of the show and sign up for podcasts, visit our website, InContextReport.com. Shows are also available through iTunes and archived at WPKN.org and Radio for All. You can watch our videos on the In Context Report YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and you can write to us at Ken at MDRtalk.org. As we've talked about before, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States had sort of a stability, a mutually assured destruction prevented an all-out war, and we sort of respected each other's spheres. We didn't evade Eastern Europe, and they didn't launch an attack on Western Europe. But since the end of the Cold War, the United States really discarded that balance and then moved into a, a drive for global hegemony under George Bush Sr. with the initial invasion of the Persian Gulf in 1991. And isn't that really go to the crux of the problem now? We're not respecting any Russian sphere of influence. Well, I think very much so. I mean, the key to look at the Russian view, the Americans have a very sort of European view of the world, which is a very global view. But the Russians view the world in concentric circles, if you will, emanating from Moscow, from the Kremlin at the center, Russia at the center, and then radiating out, kind of like how the medieval world viewed Jerusalem as the center of the world. Because all of this stems originally from the Mongol invasion of Russia when they were obliterated by an invading power. And ever since then, they've just been constantly invaded by outsiders, whether it was the Mongols or the Ottomans or the French or later on the Germans. Of course, during the Russian Civil War, a coalition of 12 nations, which include the United States, Japan, Great Britain, Italy, amongst others. Their paranoia, if you will, is rooted in their history. And this paranoia doesn't go away because we're circling them in again with NATO, with these command centers, with our military bases. We're again hemming them in. And in the Russian mindset, this plays into their historical paranoia. Now, Marshand, I'd like to, and Gus, I'd like to turn to another important conflict. That is the Western conflict with the Islamic State. And in the recent weeks, there have been important developments in the war in Iraq, especially in Anbar province, including an attack on a very important air base and the capture of a significant town, al-Baghdadi. Could you talk about the developments in Iraq in the war against the Islamic State? 
this was something I predicted a long time ago was that there was no way our airstrikes were going to be enough to stop the Islamic State. I mean, they have a tremendous amount of momentum. They've learned to evade our airstrikes. And we're just, we, we don't have enough firepower on the ground. And certainly the Iraqis and the Syrians don't have enough firepower on the ground by themselves, even with Iranian Hezbollah, and in the case of Syria, Russian advisors, they don't have enough to, to completely turn the tide. So what we're seeing is ISIS is still advancing just at a slower rate than they were before, but they're still advancing. They now control almost all of Anbar province, with the exception of Al-Assad Air Base, where there are about 300 Marines training Iraqi troops. Now, the, the significance here of the advance towards al-Assad air base is that it's putting American troops directly in the line of fire. One of the things that always strikes me as odd is the fact that we think it's a good idea to antagonize the Russians while basically ignoring the fastest growing threat in the Middle East, which is ISIS. Because mm -hmm. right now also, they have advanced very strongly in Sinai. They now, they, they regularly have launched attacks that kill 20, 30 Egyptian soldiers. They killed an Egyptian general not that long ago. And they declared Sinai the Islamic State province of Sinai. Now they're starting to take over parts of Libya. So when we see that map that's always presented on the mainstream media outlets showing just parts of Iraq and Syria under their control, it's really much wider. And that's why just to paint them as any old terrorist organization is to ignore the real threat that they are, which is a large military force controlling a very large landmass. Well, they're very decentralized, so anybody can join it. And to to when to say like they're in Libya or you know they're on the African continent, I mean it's not that they you know like it was the Blitzkrieg. You know they they launched out their borders westward. It's just that you know little pockets of supporters or sympathizers join forces with them, and now they've opened up a new front someplace else. I mean it's more like a virus spreading than a than a a, a, a battlefront. There's a very important concept in the Middle East called baya, which is to give your allegiance. When you give your allegiance, even if you're a small group, that it's decentralized in the fact that it's many, many small groups. But once they give their baya, it means absolute loyalty to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So if he says jump, even though your organization is in Libya, you do exactly what he says because mm -hmm. you have sworn allegiance to him. They wrap themselves in the banner of Islam and, you know, jihad and everything. But the fact is, is that it's much more of an Arab-centric, almost Arab nationalistic type movement. They're wiping out non-Arabs, even though they're Muslims. They're wiping out Shiites. They're wiping out Christians, basically anybody who could oppose them. But they're gaining momentum largely because they're viewed amongst a lot of Arabs as an anti-Western force. And that's why a lot of mm -hmm. nominally former secularist entities like Ba'athists, many of the ISIS commanders and governors are former Iraqi generals, former Iraqi governors who were smoking and drinking with Saddam Hussein, to quote Fox News, actually, they said that, you know, smoking and drinking with Saddam Hussein, and now they've joined ranks with these militant Wahhabis. In, in fact, in fact, they, they, excuse me, I've got to just give some background, Marshawn. The Islamic State's roots was that they were the leading Sunni opposition to the American occupation in Iraq. Now, the situation in Anbar uh, province, can you talk about where is that in Iraq and how significant is it that the Islamic State's making advances there? Anbar province is a large swathe of the western Iraq that borders Baghdad. It uh, consists of a couple major cities. Al-Baghdadi was a, a decently sized city, but Fallujah, probably most importantly, where the U.S. fought a very bloody battle to subdue what was then Islamic State in Iraq, ISI, before it became ISIS and then before it became the Islamic State. This area is home to a lot of very important Iraqi Sunni tribes. It was nicknamed the Sunni Triangle during the war. To control that, they control, basically they have Baghdad virtually surrounded, and the Shia, who are, are really only significant support in Iraq, aside from the Kurds and the Yazidis and the Christians, now only really control a section of southern Iraq and the city of Baghdad, which is ever more becoming surrounded by ISIS. You now, it's interesting that a Sunni Muslim leader by the name of Sheikh Naim al Gaoud disputed U.S. claims that it is winning the war in Anbar province and called for U.S. ground troops to save the day. Oh, boy. The fact is, is that we're not winning the ground war. ISIS is still advancing in spite of our airstrikes. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that our airstrikes are not very well coordinated. Realistically speaking, 
If we coordinated with the Syrians, the Iranians, the Iraqis, and the Russians, we could really deal a death blow to ISIS. The problem <laughs> You mean is, the people with military strategy and not the uh, Yahoo's and pickup trucks. And this is a theme actually <laughs> exactly. we've expressed and, in the, uh, right. you've expressed, March many yeah. times, is that we have common cause with the Russians and the Iranians in opposing these Islamist militants. And they have their problems with them just as we do. And it would be very useful for us to coordinate our military yeah. efforts. And I think it was your assessment that the, the, uh, the combined combination of these forces w would easily defeat the Islamic State. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we like to say, well, we don't like the Iranians because they don't like the Israelis and we don't like the Syrians because, well, they like the Russians. But the fact is, is, look, the world is what it is, realpolitik. We didn't like Stalin. In fact, we did everything we could to overthrow the Soviet government. But when Hitler came to power, we realized that we couldn't fight both the Russians and the Nazis at the same time. Iran hasn't said they're going to bomb American cities. Russia hasn't said they're going to bomb American cities. Neither is Syria. So instead of backing these yahoos, as you put it, in places like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, you know, the Emirate states, who are all, by the way, supporting ISIS, we should be throwing our weight into a coalition with the Egyptians, with the Syrians, with the Iranians, and with the Russians. And you know what? Once the dust settles, then we can sort out, you know, who's going to rule the Middle East. But until then, ISIS is still the number one threat. And without a significant ground force present, whether American, Syrian, Iranian, Iraqi, or otherwise, there's no way you can defeat ISIS just from the air. The worst case scenario is that if they take over most of Iraq and they continue to gain territory in Africa, North Africa, mm -hmm. and throughout the Middle East, and the Pakistani Taliban, actually, as of last year, according to NBC, swore allegiance to ISIS. The more they gain in power, the more that they become the symbol for beating the Americans, the more of a threat they'll become. And they possess, we know for a fact they possess things like chemical weapons because they have Saddam's old stockpile, which they've uncovered. They have the chemical weapons they captured from the Syrian army, and they've used them against the Kurds. They've used them against the Syrian government. And who's to say that these same people are not going to, with Saudi money, bring those chemical weapons over to the U.S.? And besides, we're just doing them a favor by America being the face of the opposition. You know, if if it is a coalition of forces and, you know, we divide it up, we divide up the front line and say, OK, you know, the United States will handle this southwestern border and Iran can handle this portion of the border and, and Russia can handle this portion of the border. And we don't let ISIS advance any further than that. You know, yes. if that's the case, then it's it's not one face of the opposition. It's yes. not just the American flag that they're fighting yes. against. Yeah, they, yes. That has become the emblem of the enemy. Uh, the Taliban, as I understand, have pledged allegiance to the Islamic State in Pakistan. Am I correct? Yes, you are. And as well as this group that you mentioned, the Sinai Islamists have, have pledged their allegiance to, to the Islamic State. Egypt has attacked Islamists in Libya because it looks like Libya in executing uh, this large number of uh, Coptic Egyptians that were working in, in Libya is moving towards the Islamic State. What can be done to break this momentum, do you think? Well, what really what needs to be done is a large-scale military intervention by a coalition of nations. If we were to bring in the Syrians, the Jordanians have gone in wholeheartedly. I mean, the king of Jordan, who's ex-Jordanian special forces, it's some report been participating in combat operations. The Jordanian government denies it naturally. But the fact is, is that the Jordanians have gone headlong into this fight. The Egyptians have. The Syrians, of course, have, and so have the Iranians. So realistically, if we build a coalition of Arab nations, we join with the Iranians and the Russians, and we could bring the Europeans in because the Europeans are launching airstrikes, it could be a global coalition, and a massive military defeat for ISIS would destroy its momentum. What's uniting ISIS is not religion, but rather the banner of anti-Western, anti-U.S. Right. But, so, now, but now the Islamic State claims that it's going to reestablish the caliphate. Could you talk about what, what is the caliphate and what would its appeal be to Arabs? We tend to think of it as a very recent sort of a militant Sunni kind of Al-Qaeda, ISIS sort of concept. But the caliphate is a very ancient Islamic concept. It goes back to the founding of Islam when the Prophet Muhammad declared the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim nation. And what was very important was that after his death, they established the caliph, the leader of the Muslim world. And it was, you know, you had Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, Omar. These were the, the, the leaders of the Islamic world. 
their their role was to lead the Muslim world after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. And after this, you know, there was a split in Islam between the Sunnis and the Shia, and I know I'm skipping over a lot, but fundamentally different caliphates started. You had the Umayyads, you had the Abbasids, and eventually, probably most recently and most importantly, is you had the Ottomans. The Ottomans were a very modern Islamic state. And so too were the Abbasids. I mean, Baghdad was the center of science and medicine in a time when the rest of the world was in virtual darkness. The caliphate doesn't mean in Islam a militant Wahhabi understanding, an Al-Qaeda understanding of Sharia law. The caliphate is supposed to represent a united Muslim nation. That's really what the Ottoman Empire represented. And the Ottoman Empire collapsed in 1924 at the end of World War I. And ever since then, the Arab world in particular, but the Muslim world in general, has been grasping at something to be a unifying factor for Muslims. I think that's one of the reasons why so many Muslims had originally liked the idea of restoring the caliphate, because they thought, oh, this is going to unite the Arab world, this is going to unite the Muslim world. And then they were so alienated by what ISIS is doing, which is why every single reputable Islamic leader has come out. And whether it's from Al-Azhar in Egypt, the Islamic Council there, or in Mecca or Medina or in Qom in Iran, they've all come out and condemned ISIS because it doesn't represent what to Muslims is a true Islamic state. Because a true Islamic state is supposed to represent modernity. It's supposed to be progressive. It's supposed to represent unity for the Muslim world, not persecution and a medieval interpretation of Islam. If you just tuned in, you're listening to the In Context War Report on WPKN, 89.5 FM in Bridgeport, Connecticut, streaming at WPKN.org. I'm Ken McDermott Rowe, your host, and I'm joined by Marshawn McDermott Rowe, our military affairs commentator, and Gus Cantavero, our producer. And with regard to the different factions of Islam, I'd like to point out that we devoted a whole hour in which uh, Marshawn led us through not only the history of Islam, but all the different factions and how they play into the various conflicts around the world. That, that show is archived on our website. In that show, as I recall, Marshawn, you stated that the probably the most practical unifying force in the Arab world is religion. So in a sense, the Islamic State is headed in the right direction historically, isn't it? In a lot of ways, they're grasping onto a concept that is headed in the right direction, which is the, the Arabs tried to unite along the lines of secular ideology after the end of colonialism and uh, the independence of many of these Arab nations, Ba'athism, which was born originally out of fascism, really. And Nasser, uh, Gamal Nasser in Egypt attempted to create a, a larger uh, Arab state, right, in an alliance with other countries. Exactly. And, you know, that, that held a lot of appeal, but, you know, naturally individual Arab nationalism started to elbow its way in, and that idea never gained very much momentum because of individual Arab nationalism, and it didn't appeal to the rest of the Muslim world, because let's not forget, only 12% of the Muslim world is Arab. The largest Muslim country in the world, the most populous one, is Indonesia. To countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, China's huge Muslim population, there was very little appeal for the drive of Arab nationalism, Bosnia, Herzegovina, you know, the, it didn't appeal. But the idea of a caliphate is still something that beats in the heart of Muslims because they, they would like to see Islam and the Muslim people united under a banner of justice, a banner of unity, a banner of strength. But I would be hard-pressed to find any reputable, and I emphasize reputable because anybody can call themselves a scholar and be completely ignorant of the religion, but every reputable scholar supports the idea of an Islamic state, but not the kind that ISIS is presenting. That's why the idea has a lot of momentum in the Muslim world, a united Muslim nation that includes Sunnis, Shia, that includes Ismaili, and all these other sects, holds a lot of momentum. But... What ISIS has done and what ISIS is doing is destroying the momentum of the idea of a caliphate because of the barbarity of their regime, which in every sense is anything but Islamic in, you know, in, in, this, in the true sense of Islam, even though they wrap themselves in the banner of it. Now, we had talked in past shows, and you talked about in your uh, op-ed in the Army Times about the desirability of forming a coalition to fight the Islamic State with Russia and Iran. However, it appears the United States is not moving, is moving in a unilateral direction, uh, particularly with respect to President Obama's 
call for a new War Powers Act. Uh, This act would authorize the use of U.S. military against the Islamic State for up to three years, although it specifically excludes a, quote, enduring offensive ground combat operation. It does seem to open the door. Do you think that this is the beginning of a larger U.S. military involvement in the war against the Islamic State? I think any reasonable person knows that ISIS must be defeated, not just for the sake of world stability, but for the sake of the Islamic faith. Muslims need to fight against against the Islamic State. But the problem is, though, is that the nations in the Muslim world and indeed in the non-Muslim world that most support defeating ISIS are the ones we're not we're not bringing in. We're bringing the Saudis, the Emiratis, you know, the Gulf states and whatnot, who all fund ISIS. So basically, I think the only way we're going to end up defeating ISIS, if this is the route we're determined to take, would be with a massive U.S. ground force, because it's becoming eminently apparent that airstrikes are not working. Now, granted, if we'd been proactive from the beginning and we went in with airstrikes and special forces, we could have wiped them out when they were coming across the border in pickup trucks. But now it's a lot harder to do. Now, the Republicans argue that Obama's uh, proposal is not strong enough, and the Democrats suggest that it's a slippery slope into another quagmire war. Well, what do you think, Gus? <laughs> do you really want to know what I think? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, for guys like John McCain, it's never aggressive enough, right? I mean, I think he would probably want to authorize a, uh, you know, a nuclear warhead being dropped in the middle of the place. It seems like there's never enough death and destruction for people like that. But the the slippery slope thing is is such an understatement you know it's like it can't even it's not even coming close to grasping the concept of what's taking place because the more advisors you send in obama promised it wouldn't be boots on the ground and then there were boots on the ground but they still aren't holding weapons so it's okay yes. and then he said but they're not going to be in harm's way and then march said that they're coming up against the air force base with their front line where we have the advisors in the base and they clearly are in harm's way i mean At what point do we just call a spade a spade, you know? Are we in this or are we not in this? And it kind of seems that Obama and the U.S. government's policy is to basically just lie to the American people and tell them what they want to hear until it becomes palatable, until they get used to it. It seems like there's a a reality disconnect because we've often talked, or Marshawn, you've often talked about the capabilities of the Russian military versus that of the United States. And here we are flirting with the idea of a major ground war in Eastern Europe over the Ukraine or a major ground war in the Mideast to fight the Islamic State. Hey, just get both. (laughs) are Are we up to either of these wars, let alone both? Well, militarily, no. Our military is the smallest it's been since before the Second World War, number one. And number two... A war with the Russians would be absolutely catastrophic, let alone a military intervention in the Middle East where we do not include the important regional players. The approach we're taking here, it is either one of complete denial or just complete insanity. ISIS is a threat. We should take it out. We should work with the regional powers to build a lasting stability so that and a lasting security in the region so that a threat like ISIS doesn't emerge, and then we can worry about whether the Ukrainians have a neo-Nazi government or a pro-Russian government. But the fact is, is as things stand right now, we are risking two major ground wars that militarily we are not prepared for. And yet the United States seems to think that it can affect the outcome uh, in these uh, wars with an air campaign and special uh, forces commando operations. Is that realistic? Against ISIS, I mean, it's become clear that that's not enough. I mean, again, and I mentioned this months ago, but again, the fact is is that airstrikes are not and will never be enough. An airplane can bomb a hill, but it can't take and hold a hill. That's that's a fact. It can't take and hold a city. It can flatten a city into rubble, Mm -hmm. but it can't take or hold it. We're good at that. Oh, yeah. And then, I mean, and then you look at, well, that didn't work against ISIS. So how is that going to work against the Russians? who have an army, like, I mean, a real army, as opposed to, you know, ISIS's army is a threat, but they're not conventional, whereas the, and they're not, they're not as modern, whereas the Russians actually possess a thing called an air force and a navy, the S-400 surface-to-air missile system, the S-300 surface-to-air missile system. I mean, there is no way on earth that we can take on both these entities at the same time, let alone taking on the Russians would be a bad idea in of itself, let alone taking on the Islamic State 
and the Russians at the same time. And besides, our, our military needs a break. We need a rest and we need a chance to retool our strategies and our equipment. You can't just pull out of one engagement and just go right to the next. Morale, I would think, must be affected by, for example, Afghanistan. We've been there for, what, almost 14 years now. Uh -huh, yeah. And essentially, we're withdrawing in a situation where the country's going to likely fall to the Taliban after we leave. It's going to be a replay of Iraq. And the thing and is, everyone's, everyone now, almost everybody, recognizes that Iraq was a blunder. We shouldn't have been there. We had no reason to be there. And they come out with movies like American Sniper to try to galvanize American support for the wars. It brings people's patriotism level up and their, their support in moral sense, I guess. They feel better about it. But they still know it was a complete catastrophe and a disaster because... We went in for completely fraudulent um, reasons, and you end up with the current situation of the Islamic State. How is going back in well, with more violence that's going right. to well, solve and the As situation? we pointed out many times in the show, our foreign policy has been a disaster since certainly 1953. We overthrew the democratic government, government of mm -hmm. Mossadegh at the behest of British Petroleum and the American oil companies. Yeah. All along, we have really deserved the national interest of the United States, the, the interest of the American people in favor of oil companies. We've blundered and we've blundered, and instead of having an ally in Iran, we've had for years now an antagonistic state because mm -hmm. we saddled them with the Shah. And we seem to keep making uh, wrong decisions. And one of the reasons why we do this show mm. is to try to educate people about the history of the American foreign policy and military policy and show how we've made really serious mistakes, we can't undo history, but we can change foreign policy, and we can have a policy which would be better serve the national interest. And it seems every time I listen to an interview with another whistleblower from the State Department over the last 15 years, it always seems to have a recurring theme. Nobody around them gave a damn about what the country was actually like. You know, what it was like to live there and what the people wanted. It was always what they projected onto them. Yes. So they projected onto the situation that Saddam needed to be taken out. And then we would debathify the country and hand it over to, you know, and that everything would yes. work itself and, out. But those democracy. are rationalizations for preconceived notions, yeah. for a, a, a predetermined uh, goal, which, mm -hmm. as we know from stories about the Bush Jr. administration, that he and Cheney were pouring over maps of, of potential Iraqi oil fields from the first time they came into office. Yeah. And of course, this isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. It's not a conservative or a liberal issue. The interests of the United States should come first, not the interests mm -hmm. of corporations. Well, we know well, it isn't a Republican-Democrat issue because the policy hasn't changed from Cl uh, Bush to Clinton to Bush back to Obama. Right. It's still a complete... Uh, policy of lunacy where nothing makes any sense. It's just a constant uh, a backstab after another. Well, it makes sense if you want to hegemony over the natural resources of the right, planet. Right, that right. Make, that if your policy sense. is catastrophe, well, they're doing really well. Well, they think that it makes sense <laughs> uh, because, they, you know, Afghanistan, we were going to control the pipeline from the former Soviet republics down to, mm -hmm. to Pakistan. In Iraq, you have, uh, you know, huge oil resources. And, and, of course, the Iran, as General Wesley Clark showed, is the, the ultimate goal of our, our present mm -hmm. military expansion. And Iran has the largest combined oil and natural gases resources in the world, with a possible exception of, of Russia. So it's always been about grabbing these resources. We are still a democratic nation. The American people need to wake themselves up because nobody can do it for us. Nobody can shake us. And, we, and if we don't wake up ourselves up soon enough... It may be too late by the time the body bags start coming home from whether it's Ukraine or from the Middle East or when there's a major terrorist attack here. It'll be too late for us mm. to wake up and say, well, geez, maybe maybe we shouldn't have backed Saudi Arabia and the Emirates states who sponsored terrorists to hurt us. Maybe we should have made friends with the Syrians, the Iranians and the Russians. You know, this whole crisis is completely avoidable. if We as the people stand up for our republic for our national dignity, for our national security and national well-being. We can't leave it to the likes of these wealthy congressmen who don't have sons and daughters on the front. We have to take the future in our own hands because if you can't trust your politicians, who can you trust? You can trust yourselves. If you can't trust your media outlets, you can trust yourselves. Marshawn, that's it for this edition of the In Context War Report. Thanks very much, Marshawn and Gus. The In Context World Report is broadcast on the fourth Monday of the month at noon.
To download a copy of this show and sign up for podcasts, visit our website, incontextreport.com. Shows are also available through iTunes and are archived at wpcan.org and Radio for All. You can watch our videos on the In Context Report YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and write to us at ken at mdrtalk.org. On behalf of In Context Military Affairs commentator Marshawn McDermott Rowe, producer Gus Cantaferro, this is your host, Ken McDermott Rowe. Thanks for listening. See you next time. See you. See you.